Hi, thanks for joining us uh, here tonight for Selena Lawyers Artist Talk. My name is Jessica Telford and I'm the Marketing Coordinator for Friends of Royal Alberta Museum Society, or FRAMS for short. We're very pleased to be co-presenting this talk with the RAM. Selena Lawyer is going to tell us about the art of finger weaving and how she created her mask for the Breathe exhibition at the RAM. FRAMS is very proud to be the presenter of Breathe at the RAM. We helped bring the exhibit to the museum by paying the artist fees. We thank all our members, donors, and friends for their donations and support of Breathe. FRAMS is a charitable, not-for-profit membership organization in support of the museum and programs for all Albertans. We welcome you to become a FRAMS member and gain access to a year of fun events, discounts, and unlimited admission to the museum. Visit frams.ca to find out how to get involved. And we'd like to welcome you to join us for an upcoming virtual talk on September 23rd. Uh, jo photographer Joe Tuaniak will be taking us on a virtual tour of Abandoned Alberta, his current community exhibition at the RAM. I'll share more details in the chat window about that in a, in a few moments. Uh, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to briefly go over. Along the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat button. Please feel free to use the chat window to make comments. Uh, you can also reach out to FRAM supports in the chat window if you have any text issues. Uh, you'll also see a Q&A button along the bottom menu bar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask Selena, please enter them as we go into the Q&A window. Closed captioning is available. There's an option to activate or deactivate it along the bottom menu bar. At the end of the talk, you'll see a brief five question survey in your web browser. We would appreciate it if you could take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. And that's it for housekeeping items. I'm gonna pass things over now to Elaine Alexi, Curator of Indigenous Studies at the RAM. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Dringwainzi Shalakat, Jukdrin Shoitli, Elaine Alexi Vilji, Petlije Sat Gwichin Kwatsat Pichu. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elaine Alexi, and I'm a member of the Tetlik Wichin First Nation from Fort McPherson, Northwest Territory. I am very happy to be here this evening with you all today. I am the curator of Indigenous Studies here at the Royal Alberta Museum, and I am your host for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territory that we are all joining in from today. I am speaking to you from Amiskwichiwiskagan, Beaver Hills House, otherwise known as Edmonton, Alberta, in Treaty 6 lands, which is Nehewak, Nakota Sioux lands and homeland of the Métis Nation. Welcome to this virtual kitchen table talk. Our special guest this evening is Cree Métis maker and creator, Selena Lawyer. She will be sharing with us this evening the art of finger weaving and how she incorporated this art form in her breathe mask assumption of, a, of survival. Her mask is on display here at the Breathe exhibit at the Royal Alberta Museum. We have had the incredible opportunity to engage and speak with all Alberta artists like Selena who are featured in this exciting exhibit and to hear from them about their practice, their art making while celebrating their contribution to the Breathe exhibit. At this time, I would like to welcome Selena to this virtual space. Welcome Selena. I would like to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. So what is your name and where are you from? I'm sorry, Selena Lawyer Kasikasun. My name is Selena Lawyer. Uh, I am Kree Chi. My mom was um, Kathleen Steiner. She was from Saddle Lake First Nation. Her parents were Ralph Garvin Steiner and Isabel Davidson. My dad was a very well-known fiddler in this area, Gilbert Anderson and his uh, biological parents were Joe Anderson and Selena Callahoo. So my roots in this area go back quite a ways. And uh, I've always been a big fan of the museum, um, even when it was in the old space. And uh, really I'm very, very grateful to have this chance to share my finger weaving with people today. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, we're, we are really so lucky to have this opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, your mask is one of the most beautiful masks that we have in the exhibit and I'm sure like with the audience we'll, we're in for a real treat this evening. Um, oh, so I think to begin, you know, I like to ask this question um, uh, to, to really any artist that I speak to, um, where, 
where does your inspiration for making and creating stem from and what informs this inspiration? So for myself, as, as a person who was raised in the Métis culture, but my mom was Cree, um, I like to go back and look at things that our, our grandmothers have made. So sashes that have been made by creators um, from a long time ago. Also, I do beadwork, some beadwork and some sewing. So the beadwork that I do, I, I used um, a lot of this old beadwork that belonged to my husband's grandmother. She was a very good uh, beadworker. And so use that as an inspiration for a lot of my beadwork. So I'd like to look at the way that our grandmothers did these things, because that is, I think, what roots, um, what we can form later on. And we can take that and interpret it for the time that we're living in now, because culture learn, like culture grows and learns as it's growing. And um, only a dead culture never changes. But as we go through, it's really interesting to see that, you know, um, when you take those older ways of doing things, and you transform them into something new, it becomes another way of looking at the present, but bringing the past to it. And for me, that's very important to bring that history to what I'm doing. Mm, that's so very beautiful. It's like, you know, our grandmothers are watching us and mm -hmm. they're guiding us in some way, you know, whether mm -hmm. it be the art forms we're choosing, the beadwork, mm -hmm. the old time sewing. Um, and for you, I think uh, what's really interesting, and I think it's just such beautiful, like just, uh, you know, talking to you earlier and looking at some of the amazing pieces you brought in for your talk, um, can you be able to explain and, and talk about, you know, the art of finger weaving, how it has been such an um, important aspect of Métis culture? I mean, just even right. the materials you use, it's so, so beautiful. But can you speak about, you know, what is the history and the art of finger weaving and how did you learn? So, um, historically, finger weaving, weaving was something that was done all over Turtle Island before other people came from other places here. So the First Nations that were inhabiting this space were using natural fibers that they found. So whether it was roots or fibers from plants or different kinds of grasses or even animal um, fur from animals, like the long threads from the animal's hair, like that kind of thing, they would be using those different textiles and created patterns in weaving that they would use for making tump lines or belts, or even like um, in different areas, they would actually be weaving fairly large pieces of cloth. But for the most part, the weaving was done in very narrow strips because they had to do it in a way that wasn't set up on a loom for the most part. And so those textiles, they would have um, patterns for the different areas in North America where they were um, from. So you could recognize when you recognize a pattern, you would know that that was where someone was from. And it was like that with the beadwork as well. So there were um, area patterns where you could identify which group of people someone was from or which area someone was from based on what the patterns were. Um, so I learned, I learned to finger weave when I was a teenager. So my mom and dad ran a traditional Métis dance group. And my dad was a very traditional Métis fiddler. He had learned from his older half brother who was raised by his older half brother and learned from him how to play fiddle. And so they decided they were going to have a, a Métis, traditional Métis dance group. They were going to dress in the traditional clothes that the people wore. So my mom went and talked to her mother-in-law, who was um, a, a Métis woman, obviously, Armin Anderson. And she um, asked her, what did the people wear a long time ago? How did the women dress? How did the men dress? What did the men wear? And she said they used to wear these sashes. And so she talked about these sashes. And um, when you see a sash nowadays, you usually see something that looks a little bit like so this is the kind of a pattern that most people equate with the idea of a Métis sash. You, obviously, they're usually a little bigger than this, but this is easy to carry in here. But traditionally, um, the sashes that were woven were woven for the fur trade, and they were made usually by um, women who were either First Nations or Métis, who knew these patterns from the different areas, and they had originally learned those patterns from their First Nations mothers, but they started to use textiles that came from Europe. So they started to use cotton, they started to use wool, even silk, they would use all these different things and they would make the different kinds of patterns for their territories. And so this pattern is one that, this is actually a weaving that my mom had made um, before her arthritis got too bad. And she made this out of the traditional kind of wool that um, would have been used as a very, very small kind of a fingering weight wool. And she um, used this pattern because this was the assumption Quebec pattern. 
So there's an area in Quebec called Assumption. And the Assumption sash is one of the most famous styles of weaving that we have. And so she wanted to make a sample of what that would have looked like. Um, so she, she, cre she created that. She had started to make a very long sash for my dad out of the same kind of yarn, but uh, um, her arthritis got too bad, she never did finish it. So I have, have this sample that I have hanging up in my house to remind me of that. When I was a teenager, she decided she was going to learn how to, do the, how to make these sashes. So she found out that there was a gentleman named Jacques Ferry, who was a fresh, French Canadian gentleman who was teaching classes of finger weaving in the church of Saint, in the basement of Saint Joachim's Church in Edmonton, and he had a group called Les Amis de, Fl de Fleche or something like that. And so it was a group of women who were all probably at least sixty years old or more um, that he was teaching to do this traditional finger weaving. And he had learned from Marcel Barbeau in Quebec, who had learned from Dr. Chenier. And Dr. Chenier was one of the last people in his generation to remember how to do all the different kinds of patterns. And so. Dr. Chandier taught Marcel Barbeau. Marcel Barbeau taught um, Monsieur Berry, and Monsieur Berry was the one that taught us. So my mom and I would go to the basement of this church, and I was oh, I was like a teenager. I was in high school, and I would not tell any of my friends that I was doing this because I was so embarrassed. Because it was just like this is like an old lady thing. Like I, won't, I wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> um, now I'm very very glad that my mom forced me to go, uh, but at the time I was I wouldn't tell anybody that I was doing this. Um, but it was something that I picked up. I'd always been kind of good with doing things with my hands. So it didn't take me very long to learn how to do it. Um, when I got married and had kids, I started, I kind of, I, I wouldn't say I really dropped it, but I didn't make as many things as I do now. Um, but there's been a real resurgence in learning about traditional ways of doing AT art, art forms. And this is one that I found that um, over time I've been able to um, use in my work at the museum in St. Albert. So. I wrote a few samples of some of the things that I use at my work. So one of the things that I have, first of all, is I have this little sash that I made for use at my work. And um, it's just, it's not a very big one. I was actually, I made the ones that were about this size for my own children. When they were little, we had little, I had little sashes for them to wear when they were, um, when they would play dress up, right? So it was in with all the other dress up clothes. So there'd be a princess and a voyageur coming through the kitchen looking for a sandwich or something. It was always kind of fun like that. Um, <laughs> But this is a, a very basic pattern called a chevron. It's called a chevron pattern. And here we've got a, a stipple weave that's worked into it. And it's interesting if you do it. So if you start from one end and work to the other end when you're weaving it, it will tend to, to warp to one side. But if you um, actually start from one direction and then go another, like if you go from two directions from a central point, you end up with having this diamond shape or an eye in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So that when you're starting from a certain point, it will actually start from one way and go the other way. And when you're creating it, you want to make it so that this eye will sit in the middle of the gentleman's back. So it's very, um, it's one of those things, there's a, a lot of different um, techniques to how you put them together and the different styles and different patterns that you can make. This is one of the most, this is actually one of the more simple ones that you can learn to make. What everybody, when I do teach classes, I do make, uh, one of the first things we learn how to do is the uh, diagonal half chevron. So I did have a bunch of uh, different sashes that I brought with me, just little sample ones, so you could see the difference in them. So this is a half chevron, this is the whole chevron. And if you were to take this and fold it in half, you'd see that it is actually looks the same as this one. So if you put it together, it makes a whole chevron. So that's how. How long, how long have you been um, teaching? And, and you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, when you uh, was, starting out as a young family, you didn't do it as much, but when did you start really, um, you know, really picked it up and just really went with it? Because obviously for me looking at it, you know, I could tell you've been doing this for a very long time mm -hmm. and you could tell in your techniques and they're just, they're just so tight and they're beautiful and they're uniform. So how long have you been doing this? Well, I did off and on, like I said, make little sashes for my kids to play with kind of thing. And, you know, teddy, we have teddy bears that have sashes in our family and that kind of thing. But um, one of the ones that I made, um, my husband switched jobs partly through his career and from teaching to working in the, in the office. And I wanted him to remember um, that no matter what or where he went or whatever he did, wherever he worked, he was still the person that he was. And so I created this sash for him. He had a different one that he was wearing that um, someone else had made, a friend of his had made, but I made this sash for him and I used the assumption pattern for this one. 
And this poor sash has been all kinds of places and danced, danced in all kinds of festivals. It's been to the Tosh, it's been to Best Festival de Voyager, it's been all over the place. And um, it was getting a little ratty, so I decided I was going to make another one for him. And this one here is the one that I'm working on for him now. So we do have a video of me actually, I think working on this particular sash. I wonder if we could show that right now, just to show what it looks like when I'm actually working on the finger weaving. So if we could show that little clip of the video. So this video was made by Chris C and it shows it's kind of a close up. I'm sitting on my deck. You may hear my cat meowing in the background there, but you can see, um, I'm actually doing the weaving. It's an over under weave. And if you are a weaver, you know that when you weave, you have a warp and a weft thread. And with this, the warp threads take turns becoming the weft thread. So any thread that is a vertical up down thread will actually go sideways to the end. And where you switch the threads, where you um, switch them out is how you make the patterns. So you can see I'm coming along. I've got a, a dark, a light green thread in my hand there in this weave that we're doing right now. When I get to the orange one, I'm going to switch it around. Oh, see, I didn't do it because I missed what I was going to do because I started talking to Chris and forgot what I was doing. But when I, when I switch it, you'll see that when I get to a certain point, I will twist it with the other thread that's there. Now here I'm backing up because I started talking to Chris and forgot what I was doing. But I'm switching it in my hand right there. And then that's what creates the patterns, the different patterns. And knowing where to switch those threads and at what time as you're working through the pattern um, is how you form the different patterns that you make. So like I said, the, the half chevron is the easiest one to do. Thank you for showing the video. Um, but um, when you're doing something like this, you don't have to switch. You just start on one side and you just go over. You just keep taking it over. So in turn, each of the threads is used as a I never remember a weft thread. It goes from being a warp thread to a weft thread. It took me a long time to learn the difference between warp and weft <laughs> because I didn't use those words when I was learning um, to do it. A lot of the phraseology that uh, um, Monsieur Berry used was French words. So he would, you know, throw a French word out there and I'd be like, oh, okay, thank you. Yes, okay, I'm doing the whatever it is, right? Um, <laughs> so even, even knowing what it was called, to call it a sonture flaché. We just called them a sash at home. So I didn't realize that there was a, a, a special word for it in French, mm -hmm. um, but also in Machif, that's the same way that you would say it. It's very similar, mm -hmm. the sheath sometimes you hear people say. And so that mm -hmm. in the, both the French and the Machif is very similar when mm -hmm. they use the word to describe mm -hmm. that. So I, we probably went, I probably went there for probably two and a half years, three years and learned the different styles and the different ways of doing them, how to make a sash lie flat, um, which is which is a, a thing in itself, but um, and just learning the different kinds of patterns. So um, one of the favorite patterns is always like an arrowhead, so that it has mm. the arrowhead shape in the middle. And then once you learned how to do that, then we learned how to do also the lightning pattern. And that was one that I, I've always really loved because it just shows up so distinctly, right? And that's the pattern that was that originated in Assumption Quebec. So the lightning on either side of an arrowhead down the center of it. If you look at really, really old sashes that are in, you know, in, I'm sure you guys have one here in the RAM, but I'm sure there's more than one. And if you go to other older museums that have sashes, those are the ones that are most commonly kept because they're such a beautiful pattern. They're based on a traditional Haudenosaunee pattern that was originally the lightning with that shape in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's interesting because um, one of my ancestors was um, a, a Mohawk man who came out with the fur trade and intermarried out here. And so that's a connection that I have back to that. So when um, mm -hmm. I was making the mask, uh, that was something that I, I really thought would be appropriate for this mm -hmm. particular mask. And that's what you used in the title of your mask is like yes. you know, that, that connection to, the, to assumption, yeah. the, the assumption of survival. Um, mm. And I guess you touched about, you know, a little bit of inspiration for the creation of that mask. So mm -hmm. can you be able to share um, with us, you know, what was it like to make that specific mask and using these techniques and, um, you know, the colors and the form? And can you talk mm -hmm. about the process of, you know, what was it like to make your woven mask? So this is what ha this whole breathe thing came about because there was a... Um, there actually, I was kind of late coming to the game. Uh, Natalie Bertin had posted a question saying, where are all the beaded masks? And Lisa Shepard came on board with that. And so they were, you know, they had a, a thing and um, 
actually, I know Crystal Eddy, and she had shared some pictures of some of the masks. And I was like, wow, these are amazing, right? And she's like, you should go to this website and look at them. And I was like, okay. So I went and looked on Facebook and I was just blown away by the amount of talent that had gone into all of these masks that we were making. They were showing the whole process of, you know, this is the substrate, and this is how I'm putting the beads on, and this is what I'm doing. And it had started with beaded masks, but um, people from all over, literally all over the world, were starting to make masks out of whatever they had at hand. And so um, when you go, if you come to the, come and see the Breathe exhibit, um, you'll see that, you know, they're, they're made of glass, they're made out of birch bark, they're made out of beads, they're made out of everything you could think of that people could make them out of. One of my favorites is Don Kwan's mask that's made out of a Chinese food takeout menu. I mean, it's just using what you have at hand. So I, I saw the beaded mask and I kind of thought like, well, if I make another beaded mask, I'll just another beaded mask. <laughs> I thought, what can I do that's a little bit different? And I thought, well, I could make, nobody's made a, a finger woven mask yet. I think I could probably do that. So I literally went into my craft room and had a giant bag of yarn that was sitting there. I'm like, oh, I think I could use this yarn for that. So that was what I did. I just actually used yarn that I had at the house because we were, everything was locked down. We were in lockdown at that point. Um, and I spent a lot of time doom scrolling, right? And uh, I, was, I was at the point where um, looking at the masks gave me more, it was, it was such a positive environment that Lisa and Natalie had set up um, that I, I thought, okay, I can do this. This is something I can do because I really felt stuck as, um, as an artist, as a person, as, you know, I was, I wasn't going to work. I was still at home. Not that I don't love my husband, but we were both there together and staring at each other across the room. And while we love each other very much, it was getting to be a little bit, you know, between the doom scrolling, watching the news and all of those things, it was getting to be pretty heavy. Right. And uh, I thought, okay, this will give my brain something else to do. So I took the, the yarn that I had picked, I prayed a little bit about it and thought about the colors. I thought, what, what do I want this to look like? What do I want it to reflect, right? Like the colors that I wanted to use were the colors that I felt were um, the ones that were, were the ones that basically that besides just having them in the bag, but they were also the ones that were um, bright enough that I felt like it would kind of lighten up that heavy atmosphere. So I put them together and, you know, I spent a lot of time moving them around and trying to figure out what they want to come out of the thing. Um, once I kind of got, got it settled for that, I started doing the, the weaving. And I knew I wanted to make the mask so that it had an arrow, like the, the diamond in the front and to have arrowheads going on either side with lightning. But when you make a mat, when you make a sash, you want to make it um, flat and straight. Like you want it to be even all the way along, right? Like you don't want it to change size, right? You want it to stay the same, the same length. What I had to do was figure out how to make it go inward so that it would actually fit around a person's face. Because normally you don't wear a sash on your face. It's like putting a scarf on your face, really. It is. So, <laughs> um, it took me a, a while. To, I took it apart and put it back together a few times before I got it to where I, I knew how to reduce the size of the weave, but I wasn't sure how I was going to do that with that particular mask because I wanted to make sure that it kept the fringes that are on the side. If you look at it, I don't know. Maybe we can show a picture, a couple of pictures yeah. of the photos that I sent in. So when we made the masks, when people were putting, posting photos of it, of their photos being, um, not their photos, but their, their masks being made. So this is one that's actually um, a finished one. In, in the artist's um, statement, I talk about how the fact is that during the fur trade, they invented these masks, but we've, as Métis people, as Indigenous people, First Nations people, Métis people, Inuit people, we've survived all the different um, plagues that have come our way. And mm -hmm. I assumed that we would survive this one too. So as we're scrolling through these, I want you to notice that that beautiful model is my daughter, Jessie. And uh, these photos were taken by Viridian Photography. But uh, I think it, it really made a difference too that my daughter was my model for this because she really, uh, she really knew how to rock that mask, man. <laughs> I, this is one of her favorite pictures. And the other one is my personal favorite picture of her. Mm -hmm. right so at, at no point did I take any of, this, of the um, yarn off of it or cut it. I just put it, wove it so that it was inside the back of it, so that it continued to have the same number of yarn threads, but they just narrowed as we went to the end of the of where it attached. And I just out of the edges where the black and the yellow are, I just wove the edges of those into the straps that tie behind her face. So just so you know, it was probably like 20, 25 degrees the day that we took the picture. 
and she, her, my daughter's face was sweating because it's basically a, a scarf on your face. Yeah, uh, I had yeah, to say, yeah. can you make me a mask like this? I'm like, you can't wear this mask. Like, it's not going to protect you. It's full of little woven holes. Like, it's not going to, it will make you hot, but it will not protect you from disease. So <laughs> it's just for looks. Okay, thank you for showing those pictures. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, Such a beautiful but, design. It's it's quite intricate, like the the middle part and going out. It's, mm -hmm. it's so it was, quite yeah, amazing. It was, it was interesting to make it because it really made my brain think about how I was going to reduce the size of the of the arrowheads. Is, and that's where I reduced it was in the center rather than on the edge. And I don't know if anybody anybody else on this watching does finger weaving, but what I actually did was reduce the number of threads that were in the center of the arrowhead as I went towards the end. So I actually just tucked them under and wove them underneath. So they're actually all the threads are still there. They're just woven underneath in the back. So I don't know if that makes any sense to somebody else that's watching. It's, it's almost as if they were tucked under like that. So they were basically woven into the back of it. And if you turn them out, if you if you could turn the mask over and look at it, you would see that it's actually woven into a V in the back where this piece is actually raised up on the inside of the mask. So that was another reason why it was so hot for Jesse because it was had this extra layer of fabric it was basically woven underneath in the center of the mask. So how long, it's, how long did it take you to um, to complete it? Mm, that's a good question. Well, because I because I made it and took it apart several times. <laughs> um, but it was a good mental exercise because it took me quite a while. So with a sash like the one that I'm working on here, the, the sash that I'm making for my husband, with the with this same kind of a pattern, it takes me about an hour to do one of these repetitions. Wow. With the way with the width of this and the complexity of the pattern. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer if I'm watching TV and make a mistake, which happens. Um, but um, for the breathe mask, I was really quite focused on it. So I had to, you know, I, I would focus on it and then it would make me mad. So I'd leave it for a little while and go back to it the next day or a day, two, a day or two later. And then I'd be like, oh, okay, yes, that'll work. So it was one of those things that, you know, I, I, it gave my brain something else to think about besides the fact that people were dying all over the world of COVID and we didn't know what was causing it and all those kinds of things, right? So it gave me at least something else to think about and focus on than all that lovely doom scrolling I've been doing. I've been... Um curating this exhibit, um, the wreath exhibit here at RAM, you know, reading the artist statements has been probably, has been really powerful just to, to learn of, you know, personal experiences, the stories of, you know, the first lockdown, um, you know, the masks tells these stories of mm -hmm. the artists that they translated through the creation of these masks. So for you as a maker, um, how, and, and you kind of touched touched upon this um, already, um, but how has it been for you to create and and how this art form um, for you is healing, has been healing? Um, you mentioned the first uh, lockdown, um, you know, literally the world shut down and it was you and your husband and this was a way for you to kind of translate things in a way mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you, you used finger weaving to mm -hmm. translate this and it's so beautiful. So can you be able to talk about, you know, how this creating an art can connect to healing? So one of the things that I was taught from a very, very early age is that um, when you're making something, anything, that you have to put your intent into it. So one of the things that I found with um, my beadwork or any of my work that I was doing at that point, I did, couldn't work on anything because I was just overwhelmed with what was going on. And once I started to see the beadwork that people were doing and the other artworks that they were doing for this Breathe um, uh, Facebook page, you know, I thought I, I can put some of what I'm feeling into this mask. And I, I, when I was making it, I kept thinking to myself, like, this is, this is some uh, art form that has survived from before, the, like the way of making it, something that's survived from before contact with European people. And it's something that's going to continue to survive. We're just going to, we're going to live through this. We're going to make it through this, right? And as I was weaving and I was having difficulties, I think it's going to be difficult. We're going to have problems. Sometimes they're going to get tangled up. But every time I would, you know, step back from it and then come back to it again, I would be able to um, see it from a different perspective and see that there was a way to get through it. And I think that that's sort of a metaphor for how people, I think, were starting to work through how, how COVID was affecting them. Because I think for each person, it was different. Even though it was the same thing all over the world, each person approached it differently. 
And you see that in the artist statements, how people um, responded by what they put into their masks or on their masks. You know, there was a, you know, some, some of them are very joyful almost, you know, and they're, you know, the feeling of resilience that you get from the masks that are made, right? And some of them are, are, are so um, touching because they're so, you know, they're so close to the heart of the person that was making them. You know, they were in a, in, in a space where they weren't feeling very good about what was going on, right? Mm-hmm. So that comes through in the mask as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Breathe Project, you know, um, really started, you know, as an online Facebook group. And, mm-hmm. you know, you talked about Natalie sent out this call for artists for submissions. And for you, um, so can you be able to speak to the kind of space um, of community that was made? What was that experience like for you uh, to join this virtual community, um, you know, during the pandemic? And um, mm-hmm. so for me, um, it opened this window to a place where it was this safe space where everybody was talking about how they're feeling about, you know, what was going on. Because one of the things was I was having a hard time even articulating how I felt about what was going on in the world. And people were able to express through their art what they were feeling and how they were dealing with this and you know how the you know like when you see the fighting chickadees mask that crystal Letty made um her that was her reaction to people fighting over toilet paper like people come on you know <laughs> and for her it was a way of expressing that frustration with people fighting over such something like that um so you could see you know this is how other people were coping with these crazy things that we were seeing happening and for me, it was a way to, you know, sort of process some of those things that I was thinking about, but maybe didn't really have a way to, to think my way through or to speak my way through. So for, for me, once I got the mask made, to me, I had that sense of, of kind of an accomplishment. So it was something I had actually finished, <laughs> done during COVID, right? Where, because a lot of it felt just like waiting, right? It was just waiting for something to happen, waiting for things to open back up, waiting for a vaccine, waiting for so many things, right? Mm-hmm. And so I remember um, my mom saying the old ladies always used to do something with their hands whenever they were talking. So they'd always have some beadwork or some mending or something in their hands and they were always knitting or doing something when they were sitting chatting in the evening with people or telling stories. And so when I was working on my finger weaving, it reminded me of that as well, that, you know, this is, you know, we have to keep our hands busy because Mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, our minds will go places we don't need them to go, right? Mm. So it, it helped me to stay focused on, you know, that there was more coming, that, you know, we were going to get out of this, things were going to happen, things were going to open up. Uh, and eventually that's what happened, right? I mean, we're, we're getting there ever so slowly. I don't know. I mean, we're in the middle of Delta right now, but yeah. <laughs> Messiah faith will get there. <laughs> so have you been able to um, uh, think about, you know, creating more masks and using different mediums to explore that a little bit more? Well, that's interesting because I, you know, I made I made probably 500 masks. I sewed cloth masks for everybody in my family, everybody I knew, all the teachers I knew, I, everybody I could think of, and and um, you know, even some of the family members. I'm like, I'm making these masks. You want some? And they're like, Well, we got to pay for them. I'm like, I'm using up my scrap stash for this, guys. Like, just but people who wanted specific fabric, they, I would let them buy that fabric, and then I would I would um, I make masks for them for whatever they wanted. Um, like one of my nieces wanted. Uh, a mask with foxes on it. So we got fabric with foxes on it. So she got something like that. Um, so I was sewing all those masks and I, I literally probably made 500 of them and just gave them all away. Um, and we still have a giant stack of them sitting by the door at home. But uh, I had a bunch of leftover scraps, right? And I was looking at these scraps and I'm thinking to myself, I, I never throw it, honestly, this is terrible, but I never throw anything away. So I had all these little pieces of leftover fabric and I thought, what can I do with this, right? And what do, I'll make a quilt or something out of it. And I thought, I'm gonna use these little pieces of mask to make a crazy quilt, like an old fashioned Meiji crazy quilt. So, and I don't honestly don't have a picture of one here, well, of it here with me because it's not done yet, but um, took those little tiny pieces of, of just little pieces, like tiny, tiny pieces, and I'm putting them on a substrate that's just cotton. And then I started, I'm, I'm not finished yet, but I'm um, embroidering different crazy quilt stitches on all along the lines of all of them. It's taking longer than I thought because I'm not very fast at embroidery. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's that's the next mask that I'm making. Um, and my husband asked me, why are you making this? And I said, you know what? This is just for me, just for fun. Because for me, it's something that I've, I've always kind of wanted to make a crazy quilt, but I don't know if I really want to make a whole quilt. <laughs> so this is letting me do that process on a smaller scale. And I'm glad I have, I didn't do a big quilt because I, 
I'd still be working on it when I'm an old, old lady. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm just seeing the final <laughs> product of that amazing idea. Um, uh, so for you, mm -hmm. oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> so I just I wanted to kind of uh, draw back onto um, you know um, how impactful the Breathe Project has been on artists like yourself. You know, mm -hmm. artists and creators. Um, now that it's being exhibited, these works are being exhibited across Canada. What kind of impact? Has it been on someone like you, a creator, a maker, to be part of the Breathe Project? And what has it provide, provided for you as an outlet? Well, one of the first things is that I don't really think of myself as an artist. Um, I make things, um, and I do have certain techniques that I use that are based on old fashioned, or what do you want to say, his, um, heritage styles of making things. But a lot of times I'm making them for, for people for certain events. So like if I'm making a sash, like I made a sash for my sons when they graduated high school. Um, if I'm doing beadwork, I made a, I made a, a, a vest for my husband um, when my daughter got married. So we completed it in time for her to have the wedding. Uh, that's not quite how that worked, but it took a while for it to get going. That was another pandemic project and I couldn't work on that one either until I finished the mask. In my mind, I was not able to work on it until I finished one process and worked on the other one. So for me, it's um, always been, I've been making things that I might need, but Métis people tend to decorate everything they own <laughs> with beads or in some way. So um, for me, it was always making something for somebody in the family or making something for someone else who was getting married or something like that. So for me, I, I don't see myself as, as an artist in that same way, but it's really um, been interesting to see how far reaching of an effect it has for people to see these different styles of art, um, how far they've traveled and how many people around the world have seen them and commented on them, not just with this Breathe exhibit, but there's also Breathe the Second Wave, right? And they've done another set of masks that's I think the Royal Ontario Museum right now. So it's really interesting to see how it's it's still going, like people are still using that as a means of expressing how they're feeling about what's going on in the world, right? Mm. Yeah. One, one of the most interesting things um, that I heard commented about, you know, for creators and artists um, who are part of the Breathe Project, they come and see the exhibit and they recognize um, some of the masks and some of the names associated with mm -hmm. masks if you you knew them for a very long time but you only met oh. through virtually so i think that's really really interesting and that speaks to um you know the the great importance of online communities and how we came together and how you cope together yeah it's very interesting because you know it um when i saw don kwan's mask today when i went and looked at the, the exhibit i'm like oh that's don kwan's mask right <laughs> like oh and i recognized krista's and i recognized lisa's so i reckon you know as if we're going through i'm like oh i reckon you know you, you you feel like you know these people because you'd you've seen them maybe not them but their masks from you know when they very first began them to where wherever they you know where they are now and it's really uh it really kind of bonds people together in a way that you would never expect right um, and I'm really grateful to Natalie and Lisa for, you know, having this idea, but also um, allowing it to become something where, you know, we could, these, these masks could be exhibited that other people could see them and kind of follow the experience of what, what we've gone through, through this COVID experience we've experienced together as a, as a whole world, right? It's been really mm -hmm. interesting to see as people are going on and more masks that other people are making and the other things that they're they're doing now, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's given a it's given a real platform for some people who this is their livelihood, and it's given them a you know a broader range of people to be able to see what they're capable of doing. And I I really um, appreciate of that. Mm -hmm. So what you just mentioned um, about opening up opportunities, mm -hmm. how how has the way that you shared your art changed since the pandemic? Well, I have always been very shy about sharing my work with people. I, um, I, I don't, well, I'll, so for example, um, when Christy Belcourt did the uh, Walking With Our Sisters exhibit, I saw the beautiful um, beadwork that people were doing. And I personally felt that my beadwork wasn't good enough to contribute to that. So I did not contribute a, um, a vamp to that exhibit. 
And my daughter was after it had closed. She said, mom, I thought you were going to put one in. I'm like, no, I, I didn't. Right? <laughs> and she said, mom, you could have done that. And so, you know, for me, this is um, I, putting this mask out there is putting myself out there because when I make something for me, it's, it's always personal, right? It comes from somewhere, it comes from within me. And so for me, this is sort of in a way exposing myself to people like that sounds bad, um, but you know, exposing my 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 emotional self to people mm -hmm. in a way that maybe I would not be comfortable with normally. Um, so as an, I know that a lot of artists tend to feel things more deeply, and their art is a way of of expressing what they feel so deeply that they can't really put into words. So for me, I I feel like this is you know in a way showing a side of myself that I don't normally really share with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because art is very deeply personal and, mm -hmm. you know, it's culturally informed on a level. It also shows the spirituality of, mm -hmm. of our art form, which is really, you know, near and dear to our hearts. So mm -hmm. it's totally understandable. Um, it's true for me. Um, it always comes from a spiritual place. It comes from a place of prayer. Mm -hmm. And it's always something, like I said, I was always taught that your intent and what you're put, what you're doing is important. So if you're making something for someone to wear, it should you should always have a positive intent, a good intent for that person and for the ideas of what you're making it for, right? Mm -hmm. so for me, that's, that's always been an important part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on that note, um, mm -hmm. I would like to ask, you know, what would you like people, um, our audience members, the public, um, other folks? Who are interested about finger weaving what would you like them to take away from learning about it mm. and if there's any types of artistic practice that you can speak to as well that you that you that fulfills you whether it be beadwork mm. um, sewing i think the one thing that i would i would hope that people would take from this talking about finger weaving is just to see it as a very distinct style of weaving it's not one that a lot of people do necessarily. Um, it takes a while to learn. It's uh, it's it's um, it's something that was nearly lost, and I think it's important that we continue to practice it, not just because it's a, a thing from the past, but because we can always we need to bring those things with us into the future. Because if we don't remember this, if we don't pass it on, and our grandchildren lose that, then they're losing a part of who they are, and part of who where they come from and they are not going to know themselves if they don't know where they come from and that's something that i've always felt was really important mm, beautifully put it's uh there's um <clears throat> in terms of making and creating you know there's also that responsibility of keeping the mm -hmm. art form alive for the next generation to come yeah so totally and i, and I you know it's interesting because museums often get a bad rap for you know keeping our people's things and hiding them away but um, some of those things that they kept and hid away are ways that we can recapture what belongs to us until we are ready to take, take our things that we are ready to take care of for ourselves and put them into spaces where we can care for them in a way that will, feels good for us. Mm -hmm. I think that that's an important thing. I think that's a role that museums have played up to this point. And I think it's important that museums see themselves in that role, but also to see that they are simply holding those things for our, our grandchildren for when they're ready to take care of them on their own. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing to remember about the things that are being held in museums. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So this, uh, we are leading into our Q&A section now from the audience. Um, let me just pile some of those questions here. Um, so one of the questions that we received is, you know, how long does it take to weave a centier fleshy? I don't mm -hmm. know. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Better than the first time I ever said it. <laughs> it depends on the person, depends on the weaver. Some weavers are very fast. I am not. Um, so it probably, to make a full length sash, uh, would probably take me. So a full length sash is about 30 centimeters wide and about two meters long. Um, it would probably take me about six months of working at least an hour in, in each evening to, to work on it or an hour a day working on it. I, I don't, can't weave no longer than about an hour or two a day. Um, I'm getting old and rickety and things don't work the way they should anymore. <laughs> so I have to pace myself on these things. 
but um, my problem is, is I get excited about these projects and I get going. So I have to, I always have to pace myself. It would probably take me about six months to make one from scratch. Oh my God. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, that's a lot of amazing work. That, that's well, I've also, I've also been working, well, uh, well mm. not right now, but uh, you know, in the past I've been working at the same time as working on finger weaving. So, you know, I, it's not like I spent all day doing it. Mm -hmm. Although in the past, it's interesting, historically, women would actually do the weaving and they would have it set up in their cabin. And they would stand and do the weaving and they would get to a certain point and then the, their young children, their daughters, would be at the back untangling the weave that they had made on the other end. And that was how the young girls learned how to do the weaving. It was actually something that we had learned when we were doing the finger weaving. So it was an interesting, it was just a neat story that uh, we had been told about the, how they did it. That's that. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my next question here um, is, what is your best guidance on how to find a creative mentor or to oh. be one? Oh, well, um, I have taught finger we basic finger weaving courses out of the Machif Cultural Connections. I've done two different basic level courses. Um, and they've gone very well. Um, obviously, with COVID, it's one of those things that you, I personally feel like you really have to do in person. Um, when someone is is getting tangled up, it's very, very difficult for me to tell you over a video how to untangle that. If I'm in person, I find it's much easier. <laughs> so, you know, there's been kind of a pause on a lot of the programming that I had been doing. Um, I'm really hoping, you know, once things sort of settle down and people are vaccinated and, you know, we're, we're hopefully getting back to a little bit more normal, we'll go back to doing some of those classes. I'd like to do an introductory course again, but also to do like a more advanced ones for my first groups of students that have gone through so that they can, you know, learn different, different patterns than the ones that we do in the basic class. But it's definitely something, um, you know, I do have a number of people that have gone through the course that have, you know, just taken off with it and used it for other things. Some of them have really, um, really gone a long ways with it. So it's kind of cool. Um, Crystal Letty actually used uh, um, a little bit of finger weaving on her mask that she made to make the ties in the back. So I noticed that she had used uh, a, a chevron pattern on there, half chevron. Yeah. What would be um, your advice mm -hmm. to up and coming young Cree Métis artists uh, either who want to learn how to finger weave or get into beadwork or old time style sewing? What would be your advice to them? Um, first of all, uh, check with your family, like talk to your aunties, talk to your grandmother, talk to your, you know, the people in your family and not just the women, but sometimes the men are bead workers too and talk to them about, you know, did we have, you know, in our family, do we have a family pattern? Do we have something that our family used to do? Do we have anything like that? Uh, and then a lot of times it, it, it's, it's a matter of going out and finding someone who does that particular style of, whether it's beadwork or it's, or it's finger weaving or anything like that, and finding someone who will, you know, show you how to start at least, to get you started with something like that. Um, for me, it's always been, um, sitting around with people and doing beadwork. So one of the things that happened out of the uh, breathe thing was we, was Crystal Letty actually started a, an online beadworking circle. And once a, once a week, we'd all get together and do our beadwork virtually in a group. So our internet sucked big time, but I would still tune in and <laughs> do a bead with everybody just because it was a chance to show what you were working on or at least spend time listening to other people talk. You know, and spending time in a, in a in a way that was, and that's traditionally how the women did their work was they would sit together, sisters and aunties would all sit together and they would work together on projects that they were working on. And so for me, it's um, getting together in those kind of little little sessions with smaller groups of people is is the ideal for me um, to pass on and to learn from other people. I mean, I, there's no way that I know everything about anything. Um, and I'm always willing to, to see how someone else does something to see if, you know, I can learn to do something a different way. It's important to me to, to learn as I grow, as I get older. Mm -hmm. One more question that we have here. I think this is a really uh, important question. Um, beadworking is definitely on the uptick, but by comparison, there are also very few people doing finger weaving. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on why this is so? Ah, uh, that's interesting. I think number one, because uh, beading can be done onto a variety of different things. You can use, you can use beadwork on just simply making earrings, making um, like, you know, hair clips. You can use it to put it on clothing. You can use it in a different, a number of different ways, right? Finger weaving is uh, 
more just more of a um, specialized kind of a thing that if you need a belt, you're just going to go to, to Walmart and buy one, right? You're not going to, you know, sit down and weave one for yourself necessarily. Um, so people who are wanting to learn how to do this have to really be focused on being wanting to put the time into it because it's not, you may be able to pick up the basics of how to do it within an hour on a very basic way. Like I, I teach kids how to do it, grade four and up. And uh, I've, you know, I've had a lot of success with just getting them a very basic weave um, and they can get it in, you know, 15 minutes and they can finish a little weave in an hour. Um, but for, for someone who really wants to master the different techniques and the different styles, it takes time and it takes practice. And a lot of people I don't think necessarily um, have the time or want to spend that time that it takes to, to learn the different ways of doing it and just put that time into it because it does take time anything else those who are very good at beadwork do it be, do it a lot and they get very good at it right mm -hmm. so, same thing with finger weaving mm -hmm. yeah it bears that responsibility too right the right. constant uh mm -hmm. um practice well practice not in the sense of becoming better but the constant need to um to be just doing it you know the yeah. act of doing is very powerful so mm -hmm. that bears responsibility too yes so. And that's why I think when I when my kids were little, I still made little sashes for them to wear, you know, that kind of thing, because I still wanted to, I didn't want to forget how to do what I had learned to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was important not to lose that. Mm -hmm. One final question here. Um, mm -hmm. Do you ever teach weaving to schools? Do you ever go into schools to teach weaving? I do. So actually, I work through the Musée Heritage Museum in St. Albert, and we do actually, I, I have done a number of different programs through the museum, teaching, going out into classrooms and doing a short history of sashes and talking about them and then getting the kids to make, like I said, a very, very basic weave. We also have a very simple, a simpler one that we use with younger kids. And then we actually do like braiding with the, with the really little ones because, you know, even braiding is the most simple form of weaving. Um, but I always attach to it the teachings about the sash because to me that's important. It's, there's no point in making a sash unless you're understanding why, why we're making this. What, is this. what does this represent for the person who's teaching you how to do it? It's important for that. So I've done that. I've also worked with um, the St. Albert Children's Festival for a number of years. I worked for four years doing um, finger weaving with them as well. So that was, uh, that was another time that I did. So I, I've, I've become very good at giving instructions to small people. And if they listen, they do, they do figure out how to do it and they usually succeed. Um, the parents are the ones that are not, not always necessarily the best listeners. <laughs> kids always get it. Kids always listen. And, they always... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I do really enjoy going out with the kids because they ask questions that are always um, interesting for me because they, they think things, they always think of things differently than I do, right? So it's always quite fun to sit with them and kind of, you know, learn from them. And that was actually one of the, one of the programs that, uh, through the Musée Heritage Museum that we actually did, were able to translate to on, an online format was to do the finger weaving. So I did a few programs of that during COVID actually, once we kind of switched some of our programs over, we did a few of those um, school-wide ones where I would have everything set up and we would do it virtually. So it, it actually worked very well, um, but it was, it was one of those things that took a while for us to kind of figure out how are we going to do this, right? Isn't that, I think that's so interesting how um, technology, how we're utilizing technology today, for instance, you know, doing this virtual talk, you know, in the time of COVID, yeah. and, you know, with health and security and, you know, um, it's very interesting how these virtual technology is enabling us to become closer together. And mm -hmm. normally these types of practices, whether it be beadwork or even, you know, finger weaving is something that's more in practice, in person. Mm -hmm. But how this technology is utilizing us to come together virtually in this way to, to continue with these practices. So that's really amazing to hear that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the work that you're doing with schools, that you're, you're allowing that teaching to continue, but in this format. Well, I'm glad to I'm glad to work for an organization that recognizes that this is something that is worth doing, right? And it's worth teaching because it's something that not a lot of people would even think about, you know, presenting through their work. You know, a lot of times we have an idea that museums are boring and that we do things that are not fun for kids or that kind of thing. And one of the things that I've always loved about working with kids is that 
really, they can take anything and make it fun, right? Um, so when I'm working with the kids, when I'm showing, whether it's, you know, showing them how to do a very simple kind of bead work, or we're doing some finger weaving, or we're just talking about some other kind of thing, um, for the kids, it always seems like they're always, you know, really interested in learning, whatever it is, right? You know, they're, they're right, and they're, they're into anything that's using their hands and their brains, right? Um, sitting and listening to me talk, that's boring. Um, but getting to do something with your hands, that's interesting, right? <laughs> Amazing. Well, this um, has been incredibly wonderful, Selena. Um, it has been such a pleasure to listen to you and for you to share your knowledge. Um, I would like to say hi, Cho. Thank you, Marcy. Hi, hi. For taking the time to share with us, you know, your your art, uh, the finger weaving, how important it is for you and your culture and the making of your assumption of survival mask. Um, you know, as a curator of the Breathe exhibit, it has been such an incredible project for, for me and for us to undertake. Hearing the stories, working with artisans like yourself, bringing these stories to life. You know, I'm very excited that we have the opportunity to do so. Um, and also I'm very excited for the public to come in and view the Breathe mm -hmm. uh, in person, which you can. Uh, the Breathe exhibit is on display until October the 11th. Um, if you plan on coming to see the exhibit, um, you need to pre-purchase tickets online at royalalbertamuseum.ca. For indigenous folks, you know, it's just a, a Gentle reminder that admission is free. Um, again, you know, thank you, Selena, for this wonderful discussion today and, you know, sharing the beautiful art of finger weaving uh, and about your mask. I encourage people, please come in and see it because it's so beautiful to see in person. I just love looking at the, you know, the techniques and I have never ever, uh, you know, done finger weaving before, but I hope to in the future and that I could learn from you it's such a beautiful oh, yeah. art form. Um, I would like to say a huge thank you to the Friends of the Royal Albert Museums, Ramsh for short, uh, for co-hosting this virtual event with us. And as well, you know, for the Breathe exhibit itself, they played a huge part in allowing Breathe to come here to Edmonton. Um, a huge thank you um, for everyone here, our audience members also. Thank you for joining in this event this evening. And uh, I hope to see you all again soon. So thank you and have a great evening. Okay, Marseille. thank you very much for having me.